Chapter 1 In Which We Meet Anthony Pear If you were to go back in time and then forward again, and certain people had not been born and others had been, and if a boy with, and this is curious because he looks just like him too, exactly the same name as your great-great-great-grandmother's childhood bully hadn't slapped a butterfly out of the air with a broom when he was supposed to be sweeping the porch, you might have been born in the city of Erewald instead of your current hometown. In this alternate timeline, Erewald is a metropolitan city on the southwestern coast of a small northern island. Let us imagine you had been born there. You are taking a stroll down an apartment block. The buildings are what you might call Georgian, but George has not been as common an English name here as in our world. Let's forget about our world. Our world is Erewalt for the time being, and you are walking down a cobblestone street. Asphalt has not been invented yet, at least not here. You have just turned a corner when you hear a door slam. And up ahead, young Anthony Pear takes the first few running steps away from his childhood home. Who is Anthony Pear? These things are immediately apparent. He has black hair tied up in a little roll on the top of his head. He is dressed modestly in threadbare clothes, and his cardio could use some work. For even before he is out of view, he slows to a walk, and you can hear him breathing heavily. His lack of conditioning is due to his having been a prisoner for all of his childhood. Where other children might have gone to the park, taken a physical education course, or made a ruckus up and down the stairs of their own home, Anthony Pear scrubbed dirty clothes against a rough glass board to clean them. His hands have great endurance, for the dirty laundry of his captors was unending. You get back here this instant! cries a voice from the doorway whence had come Anthony Pear, and in a moment you get your first look at Mrs. Dutyworth Pear. She is known at the local grocery as the Hawk, and it won't be hard for you to imagine why. The lady that steps onto the outside landing of the narrow apartment has her hands on her hips, and her elbows are so sharp that you can hear them cut the air with quiet swishes as she waggles them back and forth angrily. Her face is long and thin, and her eyes flash just the way you might imagine a hunting bird of praise might. The laundry is not finished, she screeches, but at this moment Anthony Pear turns a corner and is lost to your sight. Mrs. Dutyworth Pear looks as if she might take flight after the escaping boy, but a wail behind her draws her attention. As you pass the open door, you see behind the insignificant form of the matron a sobbing infant lying on a discarded pile of blankets. Behind the babe, in the dusty shadows of the entry, a clutch of other young faces peer up at their mother. Turn your peepers, snarls Mrs. Dutyworth Pear at you, and slams the door. It won't take much time to catch up with Anthony Pear. As you make your way around the corner you earlier watched him turn, a series of thoughts may be turning in your head. You have seen the missus, and you have seen a selection of her brood. Each of them had hair as red as oranges, and faces as pale as ceramic toilets. Anthony Pear, though, has black hair and skin the color of brown. Was he a hired hand, a servant? No, he shares the family name and grew up in that dimly lit apartment. Were you to cease your suspicious tailing of our young protagonist and make your way downtown to the Erewalt census office, you might, if you were a city official with a proper access, find in the vaults the record of Anthony's adoption. Fourteen years ago, the document reads, Child Services encouraged the childless Mr. and Mrs. Pear to take on a nameless infant found abandoned in a city park. Further documents record the births of a round dozen Pear children. There are no documents containing a record of Mrs. Dutyworth Pear's verbal abuse, gratuitous entitlement or cruel disposition, nor of Mr. Giacomo Pear's absenteeism or indifference, though these would have been the most important documents you read here. We will leave this alternative view to return the existing documents to their proper filing and go back to Anthony Pear. Anthony Pear is running away from his childhood home. He is not leaving because he has just learned of his adoption, though that may be considered the straw that broke the camel's back, 
if the camel's back is his familial loyalty. He is leaving because of a childhood of awful treatment, and because the spirit of adventure was blowing in the late summer breeze. This latter element is not quite literally true, but Anthony does breathe the fresh air in deeply as he continues his trek away from the laundry room. Anthony is heading to the train station to buy a ticket to far, far away. He doesn't know that there is no such thing on the small island where he lives, just like he doesn't know that the rusty halfpenny in his raggedy vest pocket, meant to pay for his travel, is actually an old nickel washer. What he does know is where to find Erewalt Central Station, because he went there once as a toddler and has a good memory. He arrives at the station following a brisk walk of about forty-five minutes. The fountain in the square before the station is not as large as he remembers it, but remains as impressive, its dozen brass arms clicking and whirring in time with the hands of the giant clock fronting the terminal building. Anthony arrives at the quarter hour, just as an arm unfolds with a musical clacking to loose a spurt of blue water from its point. The water mists as it falls and drifts down to the fountain pool. The apparatus gurgles somewhere deep within as Anthony takes a step towards the terminal. He is arrested by a new marvel, the river of people flowing in and out of the mass of building's fanciful glass arch. Mostly familiar with people with hair as red as carrots and faces as white as fresh cotton underwear, Anthony finds the press of them even more interesting than a mechanical brass fountain, even though it is twenty meters tall and was built by the foremost modern artist of the day. Rushing towards and from the terminal are tall people, short people, people with hats, people with pets, people with children, people who are children, people who do not like children, people who do not mind children. A person with fruit in her hat forgets to mind children and runs into one, causing the child to drop his ice cream and cry. People who are reading books, people who walk into other people because they are reading books, people who are walked into because they are minding their own business when suddenly people who are reading books walk into them. People with dark hair like Anthony, people with no hair, and even one person with a hair on a leash. Anthony has never seen a hair. Anthony has never seen so many people. Nervously, he enters the stream, moving in. The sudden rush is to him both exhilarating and utterly terrifying. He is drawn through the open doorway. The massive interior plaza is an enormous wheel of human activity, traveling at incredible speeds clockwise. But Anthony Pear has never learned to go with the flow, so he goes the wrong way. And an accidental shove here and an errant elbow there sees him pop into the still eye of the cyclone. Here he finds four benches in a square with their backs to each other, and to an enormous wax plant in their center. A boy folding paper in his lap is sitting on the bench facing Anthony. Hiya, says the boy. Overwhelmed, Anthony doesn't reply, but stares wide-eyed around him at the blur of bodies. First time at the station? Anthony nods, his eyes still tripping over the unending flow. Where are you headed? Feeling in his vest pocket for the halfpenny and not finding it, Anthony whirls around in place, eyes flicking madly from face to face as they rush past him. I'm headed to school, says the boy. It's all right. We have some fun sometimes. Last term we stole all the girls. My halfpenny, mutters Anthony. What's that? The boy's face draws into a look of concern. Oh, crumbs, he says. Have you been picked? Anthony turns to face him. Picked? Pocket picked. You missing something? Yeah, says Anthony. I... He trails off, not knowing what to say. Hard luck, mate. Maybe it'll turn up. Anthony's eyes feel heavy in their sockets, the energy of his escape suddenly dissipating. Here are the dads, says the boy, standing up suddenly in a cascade of paper bits. Got a run? Hope you find your something. He is just a little taller than Anthony. As he passes, Anthony looks up into dark eyes. One of them disappears for a swift second in a wink, and then the boy has vanished into the river of people. Anthony doesn't know what to do. Numbly, he walks back into the flow, and after a series of bumps and nudges, ends up outside again, where he takes a despondent seat on the fountain's dais. 
A man walks past with a moustache so long, it tickles Anthony's toes through his thin shoes. Anthony sighs. What's got you down? comes a raspy voice, and a grizzled old person wearing only a burlap sack plomps down next to him. Anthony shrugs, not in the mood to converse with another stranger. Where are you from? Nearby, I guess, says Anthony noncommittally, brushing a wayward strand of hair behind his ear. The stranger makes as to mimic him, but as they are bald, they just end up scratching their temple. I'm not from around here, they say as if it were a secret. Anthony places his hands on the step and shifts slightly. Where are you from? From over the sea, lad. Anthony turns in genuine surprise and looks into pale blue eyes. Oh yes, my boy, over the sea. The person winks, their face crinkling. Now don't tell anyone else or I'll get into trouble. How did you get here? asks Anthony, his curiosity piqued. The stranger leans close. I flew. Their breath smells of pine needles. There are many wonderful and terrible things over the sea. Flight, lad, flight! Ah! They lean back and smile. It was a marvellous invention, my machine, but untested. I was only supposed to fly from one city to another, but got blown off course and ended up here. Suddenly, the stranger has shoved something into Anthony's lap and is standing up. I always carry an extra, they say distractedly, and then they are gone, lost in the crowd of people filling the station entrance. A red garb security guard replaces the stranger in Anthony's field of view. Telling you their life story, eh? he asks, shaking his head. Flying over the sea and what not? A load of nonsense, of course. He peers down at Anthony. I hope you're not sneaking anything untoward in that sack of yours. He laughs at his own joke. Have a good day, then. Anthony watches him turn away, and then looks down at his lap, where he sees a burlap sack. Immediately acting upon the idea that comes to him, let's prescribe it once again to the adventuresome heir, Anthony is hustling back into the crowd, the sack clutched tightly to his chest. This time he allows the flow to carry him until he is spilled out with a myriad of others near a wide archway labelled Terminal. The spilled humanity forms mindlessly into queues lined up by various stations. Anthony looks for opportunity and sees it in the form of a stocky bear-like figure roaring at a ticket agent. As he nears, Anthony can see it is, in fact, a person wrapped in a voluminous fur coat with a tall fur hat, but its humanity is still doubtful to him due to the vicious diatribe falling out of its mouth. But it serves his purpose. As the agents engage the creature with their best smiles and calmest voices, Anthony darts past them, leaps onto a baggage cart, and pulls the burlap sack over his head. He has just tucked its edge beneath his toes when a voice resolves very near him. Awful person, giving Dorian a hard time. A bag thumps onto the cart near Anthony. Hope they get kicked out. Thump. A villain if I ever saw one. There is a final thump, then the cart shifts slightly and there is a click. Whoa there, says the voice as the cart lurches forward. Under control, it rumbles onwards. A train whistle sounds, jolting Anthony's heart into a rapid pounding. Botheration, cries the baggage handler, muttering then. Puffed up fur persons made it so there's only three minutes to load. Yolanda, they say loudly. Come give us a hand, will you? Anthony hears Yolanda come near, and together the two station employees unload the cart with admirable rapidity until Anthony feels all his baggage walls disappear and he is alone upon the cart. Then hands are upon him. Give us a... grunts a voice that must be Olanda's. This one's heavy. Anthony is suddenly inverted, the pressure of limbs all over him. The burlap digs into his white-knuckled fingers, fixed fast on the mouth of the sack pulled tight over his feet and bum. Then darkness descends, and he descends roughly onto cold metal. Further luggage is pressed up against him, pushing him further into the black cavity, surely the product of further carts, and then there is a resounding clang, the chink of a locking mechanism, and Anthony is well and truly alone in complete darkness. <laughs>